All right, go ahead and take your Bibles and go to Psalm 40. All right, just so everyone is really clear on something, I'm still calling it Notes for Floats. That's my deal. Let's get sprinkled. That's Pastor Perry's deal. I'm going to make it a little tougher on the kids because I do not have a PowerPoint tonight, so you just have to work a little hard, pay attention, I'll try to make it clear for you, and then show Pastor Perry your notes, all right? Uh, Psalm 40 is a messianic psalm, which means, although it's not written, in this case, directly uh, as a prophecy about Christ, it does speak very clearly about who Christ is and what he did. Sometimes they were a bit prophetic, speaking directly. In fact, in those Messianic Psalms in the New Testament, they would often quote things about Christ. And this isn't one of those, but it is still a Messianic Psalm. And so as we read it, we're going to read the first 13 verses. We'll stop there. And uh, I'm going to ask you to read it, just thinking about three things in particular as we read. Uh, Just even before we read it, just a little tidbit that's not in my sermon, and that is verse 13 through the remainder, through verse 17, is actually repeated in Psalm 70. It's a a standalone psalm by itself, verses 13 to 17, and that is Psalm 70. So if you were to turn there, although it starts just with a couple different words, it is, uh, other than that, almost verbatim, a repeat. But we're just, we're going to stop at 13. Well, As we read it, though, I want you to think about three things. First of all, uh, David is the one who's writing this, and he's probably writing it early on in his his, uh, kingship, or actually before he's officially even king, Uh, so earlier on in his life, and he's saying these things about God, and they're absolutely true, but we can also read it, especially verses 1 through verse, um, verse 9, we can read 1 through 9 Thinking clearly of Christ, Jesus Christ fits it. In fact, you could say fits it even better than David, uh, parts of it. But, but I'd like you to also think about it from our perspective. As a church, we too can fit into Psalm 40. Now, it's written by David about his life, but it's, uh, it's true of Christ, and it hopefully should be true of us as a church as well. So would you read, we're going to read the whole, all the way through verse 13 in one reading so we get that, that whole context. Psalm 40, verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done and thy thoughts which are to usward and they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. For innumerable evils have compassed me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of mine head. Therefore, my heart faileth me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. We're going to walk through this. It's a prayer of 
of cautious blessing is kind of how I uh, title it, a prayer of cautious blessing. And it is very much about David and his life, and it starts actually with the trial that he's in, and he, he gets to that pretty quickly in verse 2, being talking about being brought up out of a horrible pit or out of terrible troubles, but he starts actually by declaring the goodness of God. So really verses 1 through 5 are all about David declaring the goodness of God, and he does it multiple ways. He talks about talking directly about God and who God is, but he also talks about what God has done. He starts in verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. David's not being um, prideful in saying that either. In fact, if you were to translate it directly in the Hebrew, literally, it would say, waiting, I did wait for the Lord. And it actually has an idea of, of tenseness, in it, that he is tense while he waits. He's a bit apprehensive, but he's very intentional about waiting. So he's made this decision in his head, I will wait for the Lord. I'm not going to move ahead. I'm not going to respond. I'm not going to do anything until God wants me to do it. I'm going to wait. And it's kind of like the idea, you ever been like that before? I'm sure. Waiting is not easy, right? I'm waiting. Lord, I just want you to know I'm still waiting here, here, right here, Lord, waiting for you to show me what you want me to do. Lord, I'm not going to do anything until, because I'm waiting until you show me. That's the idea. He's waiting, and he's patient, but he's a little bit impatient too. But he's determined. And so here he is, he's in trouble, and he's asked God for help, and God gives deliverance. It comes in verse 2, he brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Uh, this isn't just good word, I mean, it could be good word imagery. I'm not saying he was literally stuck in a miry pit. But if you've ever tried to traverse through a swamp, uh, and I'm not talking about a, a shallow swamp to your ankle or your knees, but to your hips, if you've tried to walk through miry uh, muck and, and filth, it is extremely laborious. And that's the idea. He is worn out. He cannot keep moving. And yet God brought him out. God plucked him from that and delivered him. And notice the result. Verse 3, he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. And so there's this celebration of God's doing, and he calls it a new song. He sings this new song, and many, he says, shall see it. Isn't that interesting? Many shall see it. They'll, they'll hear of God's deliverance and see the result in David's life. And so he's going to speak very much about God and God's goodness. And so this celebration turns to a, an acknowledgement that will be declared before all of the congregation. He says it in verse 4, Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works. So there's a strong declaration of God's goodness here. Notice the, the plurality of words. He says many. Many are the praises that God deserves. <clears throat> many are God's wonderful works. Notice, notice it's not just wonderful work. It's not, God, you delivered me up out of this pit. Thank you for that one thing. But he's seeing God work, and he's, he's able to point to multiple events in which God brought deliverance. So it's many, it's, uh, it, it's many works or wonderful works. On top of that, he says that God's thoughts, it's not, it's not a singular thought, but plurality of thoughts, thy thoughts which are to us word, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee, if I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered, and so he says that God's works are many, they're wonderful works, his thoughts are, are plural, and his in fact, they are unreckonable. They are beyond the ability to count what God has done for David. And so he's going to declare them. 
He's going to declare them to the, we'll see here in a little bit in verse 9, to the congregation. He's going to tell everyone that he sees what God has done. So we see here right away that it starts this praise, which is what a psalm is, a song of praise. This praise to God starts with a declaration of God's goodness. But it moves on to a dedication of God's will. A dedication to God's will in verse 6. And this is where I think the messianic aspect of the psalm really shines out for us. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come into the volume of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do thy will. When I read that, I think of Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane saying, not my will, but thy will be done. And that's, as far as the messianic aspect of this psalm, I think that's the key passage. What it's referring to is Jesus Christ's surrender of his will to God. David has the surrender here. In fact, he he even uses the word delight. I delight to do thy will. We know that it was the delight of, of Jesus Christ to do the will of the Father for which the Father had sent him. Can we, like David say, it is a delight to us to do God's will? It's a good question. I'm enjoying, this is the, the, uh, our Wednesday night book study. I'm enjoying, this is the third time I'm going through the book as I go through it with my growth group, Gentle and Lowly. It really is a, is a great picture of God's heart for us. It's not the only thing that God desires it's not, uh, uh, it's not the only aspect of Christ that we should focus on, but I do think, especially in conservative circles, the fact that Jesus Christ is gentle and lowly is not highlighted enough. And I'm really enjoying this book, but it gives us what Christ's heart is. It points to those passages, especially in the New Testament, that reveal what delights Christ, and that is to do the will of the Father. As he says here, to be gentle, to be lowly, to be the savior of the world. But notice the second half of the verse. So here God desires, and I love, I'm so glad for verses like verse 6, or this is very reminiscent of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, uh, that tells us that God does not delight in sacrifices, but a Uh, of a broken and a contrite heart. God desires those things. Psalm 51, he doesn't desire uh, that we just obey the rituals. What does he want? Verse 8, I delight to do thy will. O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. This is a clear declaration of God's will being part of a transformed heart. In fact, if we're going to talk about God's will, we cannot separate a transformed heart with obedience because a transformed heart results in obedience. Not perfect, I'm not saying perfect obedience, absolute obedience, because we're still sinful, but it does result, a transformed heart does result in obedience. So notice where the emphasis of the law is. It's not in outward action. In fact, that's really clear. Verse 6, God does not care about sacrifices. He does not care about offerings. He doesn't care about burnt offerings. What does he desire? He desires the offering of our heart. And when we write the law of God upon our heart, it's transformed. When we receive the truth of Christ in our heart, it should and will result in a transformed heart. And that will result in an obedience, not to the... Not to the Uh, the, the very rituals and practices of the Old Testament law, but to the will of Christ, the will of God, we could say. And so here, we know that this is true of Jesus. He desires to do the Father's will. Much of the time it was true of David, right? David was a man after God's own heart. Yes, he messed up, sometimes incredibly bad, and yet, He came back with that broken and contrite spirit. And so David can say, I delight to do thy will. Oh my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. The question is, can we do that? Can you do that? And only you can answer that. Do you delight to do 
the will of God. You know, here what's, what's great about this is that Christ and David is not only concerned, though, for his own will or his own obedience, but he's concerned for the righteousness of others. Verse 9, he says, I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Did you cap capture verse, verse 10? Verse 10 is a great verse. Absolutely part of the messianic psalm. I said nine earlier. It, it continues on. But notice what David says in verse 9. I have not refrained my lips from what? I have preached righteousness, he said. I declared what? The goodness of God. Well, that's what we talked about in verses 1 through 5. And so David is here saying, I am dedicated to do your will. I will preach righteousness in the congregation. Well, whose righteousness? His own? Absolutely not. Verse 10 is so clear. Whose righteousness? Whose righteousness? He says, I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. The idea is he didn't take God's righteousness and everything he learned about God and the goodness of God and just kind of tuck it away for himself, not willing to share it with anyone. No, no, no. As soon as he knew what God had done, he began sharing it with other people. Not just God's righteousness. This verse is pretty, pretty deep. He says, thy righteousness... He says, I've declared thy faithfulness, thy salvation, thy loving kindness, thy truth. He is sharing God's word and God's doings with everyone around him. In fact, he calls it simply, he, he quantifies who he's declared this to as the great congregation. I think we could take that for for David, I think we can take that to mean Israel. He's declared it before Israel. But I, I think we can take it maybe even beyond that because David gathered around him mighty men, some of them, many of them, not even of Israel. And, and I'm pretty sure David declared it to them too. In fact, David even lived for a while in, in uh, Ziklag and in, in the Philistine land. And I'm pretty sure David was willing to declare it there because all the Philistines knew who he fought for. It's a very bizarre part of Scripture. Don't ask me to try and uh, make that right. I, I don't understand it. How he can work for the enemy, yet still be working for God. Or live with the enemy. But let's think about this from the aspect of Christ. Who's the whole congregation for Christ? I think it's the world. Did, did Jesus care if it was a Jew he was speaking to or a Gentile? Not at all. He gave the water of life freely to everyone. In fact, if you read through, if you're really careful, if you, this would be a good study I would encourage you to maybe look into sometime. Study this for yourself. Find how, how much of the three years, or it's a little over three years, that Jesus had public ministry. Find out, look up how much of it he did outside of Israel. There were months on end where he was outside of Israel ministering to non-Jews, preaching the gospel even. Acts is not the first time the Gentiles, many of the Gentiles heard or were introduced to the gospel. Jesus Christ did it. Jesus Christ introduced his righteousness and his faithfulness and his salvation and his loving kindness and his truth to the world. Now think about it from our perspective, from the church. Can you say verse 10? Can we say verse 10? We have not hid thy righteousness within our hearts. We have not, or we have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. We have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the world around us. Can we say those things? I hope so. And so, here, David, as he's writing this psalm and as it's relevant to Christ, he talks about the declaration of God's goodness in verse 5. He talks about the dedication to God's will. He's dedicated to doing what God desires in verses 6 through 10. 
But I think there's also in verse 10 through 13 a danger. A danger amidst blessing. Verse 10, he makes that declaration of what he has, what he has stated about God. How he has not uh, hid the righteousness. Verse 11, he says, withhold not. So there's a prayer here. Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. For innumerable evils have compassed me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore, my heart faileth me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Do you ever feel like that? Like, I just got out of one trouble. And Lord, I was, I was patient. I waited for you, and I waited, and I waited, and now I'm in another trouble. Not that we're probably sharing the exact same troubles that David had. I don't know if any of you have had a, one of your sons try to murder you, but uh, we, we maybe have not experienced the same things that David has experienced, but we, we do feel that sometimes. We're in trouble, things aren't going well, and, and we're having a hard time trusting, but we, we're resolved that we're going to trust, and we get through that, and we're excited to share it with other people, and pretty soon we stumble into more trouble. That's David here. So more trouble, is in the midst of blessing, more trouble came. And so here he is, doing everything right. He's, he's declaring God's goodness. He's displaying God's loving kindness. He's talking freely about God's truth and God's righteousness and God's salvation. And very quickly, from verse 10, he turns into this, prayer, Lord, withhold not thy tender mercies from me. In other words, Lord, please, can you, can you please just keep the blessings coming? I kind of like the blessings. Not so much the trouble. I like the blessings. And we're certainly like that. We want the blessings. We want the loving kindness. We need the truth. And so he's, he says, Lord, continually, may they continually preserve me. Why? Because he has found himself in more trouble. In fact, he says innumerable evils. He sure gets in a lot of trouble, I guess. There's so many tough things going on, he's struggling, struggling even to count them. And I'm sure you, you've experienced times like that where it's hard, I guess you could say, to put this in like layman's terms, it's, it's hard to concentrate. It's hard to keep focused on what you're supposed to be doing. It's hard to even organize sometimes all the difficulties that are flowing towards us. And so he says, Lord, I just, I, I just need you. I, I need you. Because my heart faileth me. You see, in the midst of blessing, there is danger. We know that. In the midst of blessing, we can become complacent. In the midst of blessing, we can let our guard down. And David says, Lord, I just, I still need you. I need your tender mercies. I need your loving kindness to continually preserve me. So this whole, this whole psalm is based off not just one trial, but multiple trials. And David knows that he needs deliverance. A continued need, in fact. Verse 13, be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. In fact, he goes on in that verse 14 to 17 to talk more about his trouble. But, you know, I think our church can sit in the same condition as David. Things are going really good. This is not like a doom and gloom sermon. This is it's meant to be the opposite. The Lord is blessing. We had 100 or 290 people here this morning. Over a dozen unsaved people heard the gospel in person, and I know of more that heard of it on the live stream. The Lord, number-wise, is blessing, but even better than numbers, are, are, we see the growth that's occurring, even like on our, our Wednesday night growth groups. We have a problem. We're still trying to figure it out. We don't have enough room. There were 14 men uh, jammed in the, uh, in the storage room the other day. I wanted to go. I was going to go into that one, and then I, oh, whoa, <laughs> there's a lot of guys in there. I think I'll find a different place. So I found one with 12. There's a lot good going on. We have, 
we had over 112 people, adults, participating in our growth groups. Can I remind you a little bit when we started a year and a half ago? On Wednesday nights, we'd have about 30, 35 people. And to be honest, when we started the growth groups, it was kind of like a, uh. But we've seen people growing in incredible ways. We've seen people, all of a sudden, a great hunger for God's word in their, in their life, a desire to open up an accountability and share with other people. We've, saw, we've seen friendships blossom that there weren't before. We, we've seen such growth that we have more problems, <laughs> Right? We need more space. Not just space, we need more teachers. Not just more teachers, we need children's workers because frankly, not a lot of people want to go to the children's ministry and work because the other option, growth groups, looks pretty good. Right? So we've got more kids, yet not more workers. These are all good problems to have. I'm glad we're having them. But at the same time, let's, let's not let our guard down. We still need Christ's loving kindness and mercy. Can I tell you that Satan loves a church that thinks they're spiritual but makes no difference? He loves a church that's just, let me put it this way, kind of cruising, not really doing anything. To, let me put it bluntly, an ineffective church. Christ, Satan loves it. You can go to church all you want as long as you're not effective. But you know what Satan hates? An effective church? A church that's growing, a church that's maturing, those are the places that he loves to attack. And so I just, I, I warn you with trepidation, but gladness, let's be on guard, because Satan would love to tear our church apart. He would love to send trials to us to get our focus off of Christ and onto the issues around us. But let's be like David, let's be like Christ, and let's continue to declare God's goodness let us say, I have not hid your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great congregation. Let us continue to grow and continue to mature and continue to give God praise. But let's be on guard. Let's make sure we're doing what Christ has left us here to do, and that is to declare the righteousness and the loving kindness and the salvation of our Lord. So let us stay faithful. Let us agree with David and let us agree with Christ that we need his loving kindness. We need his mercy because we want to use every moment we can to declare who Christ is to the world around us. So be encouraged. God is doing good things and uh, there's still a lot of work to do. I'm not saying there's not work to do. There's a lot of work to do. There's still maturing that needs to happen. There's still service that needs to be picked up. There's still uh, a lot of conforming to, to the image of Christ. But I'm glad that we're seeing it. I'm glad that Christ is multiplying. I'm glad that he is growing the church and that we get to participate with him. So we're going to close out uh, the sermon. I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask you to prepare your hearts to answer kind of that same question that, I, that I, I asked along here. How are you doing at verse 10? How are you doing at declaring the righteousness of Jesus Christ and the faithfulness and his salvation and his loving kindness and his truth to our congregation and to the world around us?